Hoseo. Hoseo. That's a Cherokee greeting. I'm continuing from last week. Her story. Her story. And her story also includes, and no less, the story of the ancient ancestress of our Turtle Island and the people, Native Americans, of our Turtle Island. American history, you've heard of that. That's a fable at best. What kind of fable? It's a biased fable. Biased from the Greek word epikarsios, meaning oblique, slanted, and now prejudiced. What we want to see is our story, our story as it is here. And that's pretty much my theme, to show, make evident, that people have stemmed here from the Mediterranean and the Old World from long, long ago and continually. And in particularly in the Southwest, the Southwest uh, people, um, linguistically speaking, the Utu Aztecan, all of the Utu Aztecan people, this goes on into Mexico, certainly all in Northwest Mexico, shows uh, Semitic language evidence. So I'll be talking about that. The only people in the Southwest that are not of that language group are people who are modernly called by the Americans Apaches and Navajo. Their language is Turkestanic. And the, uh, let me say, the relation of the Turkestanic of these people to, compared to modern Turkish, is about our English to the English of Chaucer. And about in that same uh, space of time, what, two or three hundred years, that kind of difference. So they are the exceptions in this particular case. And I want to start off with the oldest thing that's first. I mean, that's what I'm starting with. You can go up here to this photograph here that we're looking at. Uh, this photograph is of a site that we refer to as Winnemucca. That is Lake Winnemucca. It's now a dry lake. It's in Nevada. It is sort of parallel to Pyramid Lake, which is full of water. And Winnemucca is actually an Arabic name, meaning one moccasin. And a lot of archaeological work has been done there. And the archaeological findings is that Lake Winnemucca, its surroundings, have been continually occupied for 11,000 years. That's quite a thing. The people who live around there, who would be the native indigenous or Indian people, um, are the Numa or the Numana. The Americans gave them the name Paiutes, and that's pretty much common, but they know themselves as the Numa, which is very interesting because um, the Numa from Numidia are from East Libya, just before you go into West Egypt. And that seems to be in accord um, to have that in this site. So here in this particular um, place here, this is probably the largest petroglyphs in North America. This is just one part of it here. And it is recognizable in the ancient goddess culture. When I was first introduced to it, I think maybe it was like 40 years ago, you can look here. Um, I found this book in the local bookstore, and that pretty much clued me in. This book, uh, The Great Goddess, you know, by <coughs> Sibel von Kusraden. And everything that I found in here, I could see there at this site in Lake Winnemucca. Mainly, the islands in the Mediterranean Sea, like Malta, has the same features. So that was a start, that was a clue. And eventually, uh, other books have come out since that time, and that was books by Maria Gambudis. She's put out several books like this. Uh, I think the first one was The Gods and Goddesses of Old Europe. And we have you know, three or four of her books here. So there was a lot, and she, was, she is an archaeologist, she has passed away, and because of that, Claudia had written her a letter uh, 
in, in just, you know, she says, you know, um, be, because of our keen interest and study in the area of ancient languages, and because of our profound and movie sense of the great goddess in our lives, we would be most grateful to you if you could look at the enclosed photos and comment as to what you might consider are their possibilities. Any sun's light you can shed on the above interest will be respected in our own search for her memory in us as contemporary women who are willing to risk all to rediscover her in ourselves. So Claudia sent Maria many photographs that included this and other, other parts of it to Maria Gambudis then her return, she's in Southern California, Topanga, and I'll read Maria's uh, letter to Claudia. And this was uh, October 8, 1991. I have received the beautiful photographs of rock engraving from Nevada. From the first impression, you would think they are from Ireland. Indeed, these symbols are astonishingly related. For instance, the symbols engraved are like engraved rocks from famous tombs, Noah, Newgrange, La Cru, and others. Even the combinations of the signs are repeated, such as snakes, suns, trees of life, rising arches, or concentric circles, ladder motif, interconnected circles. And then she says, if you would like to see more illustrations, then are those published in my book, then there are these other books that she lists, you know. Um, the question arises, of course, how come the striking similarity? The answer probably is their religious and symbolic structure was related to that of old Europe, and that symbols and religious ideas are long-lasting and survive over millennia. Perhaps in the future, context between Nevada and Eurasia will be understood better than they are now. So, um, uh, she lists some other books that, where you could find new ideas of linguistic and other relationships. I can't say more, much more, because I never had a chance to study the Nevada rock gravings. For the interpretations, you have to have all the possible information, chronologies, and associations, and so forth. Again, I thank you for sending me these very valuable and interesting photographs. Sincerely, Marija Gambudas. So that's a, a good way to start with this. Um, I'm going to say that I consider this as the Temple of Lamia. Now, Lamia is North Africa. The name, I'm sure everybody's heard of, Libya, is the country Libya. Libya is the Greek name for Lamia. And all of North Africa to the Greeks belong to the providence of Lamia. They named Libya, and so forth. So, everything that's here, I consider from all that I've learned, uh, was what I would call, this is the Temple of Lamia. Lamia, in the Greeks, become Athena. So, we'll go with that. Directly across from this site, across the other side of the lake, in other words, there was uh, Lake Winnemucca. Thanks to the Americans, now there is no water in it because they cut the channel off. <clears throat> but, on their side of the lake, there's a cave 60 feet high. And in this cave, there was, you know, an interment. Somebody was interned there. And the whole cave is painted red. It's all red. And the archaeologists examined that cage, and they found interred in there the mummy of a woman. And they later dated this woman as 6,000 years old. And they also dubbed this mummy the name Lilith. I think probably uh, they were only thinking the idea that Lilith uh, is found in ancient ruins and in remote and desolated places, which you know, pretty much uh, fits this. <clears throat> and in that cave also, there were very many baskets. These baskets would be uh, offerings. 
Now it's a very dry climate, so that's how that these things had survived for so long. But I made this here to stand for her, to, to honor her. Obviously, the whole cave is painted red with, with uh, some kind of ochre, red ochre. Uh, and even down in front of the cave uh, was a long rock. Uh, it had been painted red and had what resembled some kind of letters. At the time, I did try to make them out and so forth. But to say a Lilith, since it was just that the archaeologists, um, you know, gave her that name. Lilith means of the night. And here is a chant. O oh, flyer in a dark chamber, go away at once, O oh, Lily. And the lines of that is an incantation to help women in childbirth. And it was written in the Phoenician dialect of the 7th century BC. And it was written on the body, you know, like a statue of a winged woman. And this winged woman, of course, has become angels. <laughs> angels everywhere. <laughs> So Lilith has had a, a full 4,000 year history, like that, and um, the uh, patriarchy people, they, they really did a job on her and so forth, but you know, she, she still survives, and this is you know, actually a Navajo, you are calling Sam painting, it is, it is a sacred piece, it's done by a, a, a woman, uh, Yazi, like that, and that's, I thought it was very suitable that I could honor her that way. Uh, then we can come over here and you see this here. Uh, this is from Camutis' book, it's an illustration, and it's called a marmot symbol, and it means the cooking pot. And it was one of the main things that it got me onto this, because here it is looking to the side, but that's what I recognized here, is this is a symbol of this, which is a symbol and she has you know, three or four variations on this symbol. The other thing here is the eye, this eye. Now in the ancient myth that's in the Mediterranean, like Malta, um, you have an ancient, um, what do you call, woman cyclops is what she is, she's a cyclops. Across from this, uh, this is kind of like on a mound, pretty big mound, and it goes down in a gully on the other side, there is another huge formation in which in two sides there are caves. And these caves were also examined by the archaeologists. And at least in one of them, they found an infant interred there and accompanied with uh, rebirth symbols painted on the walls. All of this is in Gimbutas. So, you know, that's, you know, part of it. But in the myth, the Cyclops woman she digs out this cave. It's like she's digging it out and she piles it over here. So this is the inside out of the cave. You see? That's, that's the myth for this. And so the eye. And even in the books describing you know, Malta, it looks out upon a terrain very similar. And also <laughs> this material is called tufa, which was made when the whole place was covered with water. <coughs> so that's all the way that we're introducing this very, very ancient site. And maybe we would say it's 6,000 years old. Now if we go over to Pyramid Lake, there's you know, a small mountain range separating the two lakes, we go over to Pyramid Lake and we can go over here and you can look at this side. <clears throat> so there's a huge uh, tufa edifice that I've dubbed the Sphinx of Pyramid Lake because it looks like it, like that. And among many things that are painted there, which are Egyptian, they are Egyptian. And let me start with this one first. Let me start and look, look there at that. Yeah. This is a painting of Kepra. Kepra in the Egypt uh, is modeled on the uh, beetle. This is the beetle here. This is a scarab beetle. And Kepra means to become, to come about. 
<clears throat> and he's called the germ of life. He is male, but here he is. Right here would be the water line. In other words, either when they painted this, or in earlier times, there was water right, right here. And so he's come up out of the primal water. Newt, Newt is the female um, for the primal water. So it's what he says in his myth. And he comes onto the pebble beach. That's what these are, the pebble beach. And he finds a place to stand. So he's called the germ of life. And he's the pre-sun of this of you know the sun that becomes Ra or Re, like that. So this is you know very, very significant here. And that I would guess that all of this whole site, which is all the Egyptian myth, it's got everything in it. <clears throat> and I'm just showing you just a couple of them. Uh, that this is also meant that the Egyptians had this view. He symbolizes life from death also. So, certainly all of this that had been painted there, because they are all paintings, uh, meant that. Meant, you know, uh, like Jim Morrison's song, you know, they painted on the wall before the fall for us to find. That's kind of what this looks like. So that's Kepra, and that's the beetle. And then we can go over here to this one. I showed a version of it a couple weeks ago. <coughs> This is Seket, or Bass, uh, in the peculiar shape. This is a fire tongs. The fire tongs is what's given her name. If she's Bast, it means fire. Um, or Seket means flame. Either way, we have either one. And here, uh, this is the house of the moon. So she's associated with the moon. She's also associated with childbirth. And, and the person who made this, you know, very neatly, even better than me, carved this perfect circle in to reveal the white underneath the, you know, the, the outer rock, like that. So that this is, you know, called Het Aya, which means in Egypt, you know, House of the Moon. And what's going on here, and this is the most interesting thing, this is the sun. And this is, this, this is the most interesting to me. Um, this is now... She is causing or making the birth of the sun. Now what this is, I can only do it two dimensional, was on the rock itself there had been a natural bubble, a large bubble. And that bubble was broken by the time somebody came along with this paint. And the person made this to look like that because the sun was conceived as a pomegranate a pomegranate with many seeds. Uh, this is a theme that was very constant for a long time in the Mediterranean and even known by the Spanish name Granada. So uh, the ancient place in Spain, Granada, uh, also refers to the Spaniards named the place where the Zuni lived, New Granada. So the idea of the sun having many seeds, you would say, would stand for all of that. Another thing here, if we look at this, this is a very large uh, petroglyph, I should say, that is carved at this site up here. And it is very decidedly Egyptian. It is a petroglyph of Rem, or Remy. Now, in the myth of Kepra, this is the beetle right here, he is saying in a couple of lines, you know, I cried my eye. So these are the tears, you know, coming down from which he created men and women. And most decidedly, this form here is the Egyptian glyph, we'll call it, for the letter R. And that's absolutely conclusive that this is Egyptian. And this goes with, you know, how he rises up. And the whole thing, I've, d I've done the coloring in this to, to um, bring it out. So this is Remy. That's a very large, deep petroglyph at this site that is certainly Egyptian. And then we can go down here. I've showed this before. This is also painted on um, a tufa at the same site as all of these other Egyptian things, but in a separate uh, rock form that's very interesting because it, it's about uh, 
higher, you know, chest high, and it curls. It's, it's, it's a separate rock that curled in like the inside of a shell. And inside, this is painted, you know, here. And this would be the symbol of Athena or Lamia, as called, you know, the uh, double thunder shield, basically, which is the uh, double valve mollusk. So that's exactly what I put here in this way. So uh, other things, we can come over here. Uh, this is a petroglyph that is located along the Truckee River. This is uh, called the Court of Antiquity. <clears throat> and it's also the place where I have found and illustrated before the Stone of Bell, which is Celtic. So this petroglyph, decidedly, is Celtic. There's a red inclusion in the rock, and I think that that's what stimulated the person to engrave this. And what it is, is BN, BN, for Boan, Boan, the good mother, and she is here, the symbol of spring. So, a court of antiquity, of course, had many, many um, petroglyphs here. And another thing that I mentioned, if you can go all the way over here, and look at that. This is in Eastern California. It is at a site that is called Swansea. It is uh, alongside of Owens Lake, or pronounced Owens Loch, which means White Lake. And the place is called Swansea, which coincidentally is actually the name of place in Wales. There is a huge marble outbluff there. And the whole place, with an engraving, has been dedicated to the Celtic god Lug. Now, Lug is the Celtic version of the Mediterranean Apollo. And Apollo is called the Hyperborean, meaning beyond the north wind, meaning he makes trips, you know, up there to the British Isles uh, seasonally, and then comes down to the Mediterranean, you know, for the summer. Uh, basically, that's who he is. <clears throat> and the site is dedicated to blue. And this is uh, what I've made in miniature. These are the zodiac. This is the zodiac that has been packed into the marble bluff. The covering of the marble is gray. And when you uh, break through the, the surface of it, then you will find it's white. So what's interesting of this, I worked it out one time, I don't remember it all now, but the main thing is, is that this would be early Greek, I think, but certainly uh, Mediterranean, because there are only ten houses. I can certainly start with this is Virgo and Leo, and that would be Cancer, and maybe this is Capricorn and Sagittarius. This obviously is, you know, Sagittarius. I'm not sure, I don't remember what the other ones, and this uh, is the Sun, or House of the Sun. So uh, it's an early version of the Zodiac as as far as I know, would have been in Greece. And there are many other, many other petroglyphs in this uh, region uh, to, to go along with, with all of this. Um, the other thing I want to come to is, you know, right here, this is what we would call a Kachina carving. This is Hopi, the people being called Hopi, who live there in Arizona. Now these are another people. Uh, that belong to this language we call Uto-Aztecan that is Semitic. Their ancestors have come from the Eastern Nile Delta. I even know the specific place. It overlooks the Sinai, the Sinai Peninsula, where the turquoise mines were that the Egyptians used. So that would tell you why there is such interest in turquoise among the Hopi. And there is definitely other things in the Hopi culture that show they have indeed come from that part of Egypt. We would call it, you know, Lower Egypt, the, the Nile Delta. The Kachina uh, cult in particular probably seems to come, around, come about in maybe the 14th century. How much of the Egyptian is actually figured through it, well, I'm not sure, other than both Egyptians and Hopi were animal or helmet type masks, right? So I think, you know, she is, she is uh, somebody there. 
And then we want to look at this figure here. This is here you know, from east of San Diego. This is from an area east of San Diego uh, called uh, uh, Hakumba, the place of the wild gourd. And this you know, typifies this ancient culture. In Gimbutas, I'm going to open the book here to show this illustration. So she has a number of illustrations here that is showing, you know, this, you know, some being in, in rock or clay or whatever it's made of, you know, with an open mouth. And that's the way she's titling it and she's explaining what this is about. So, we, you know, that I have a, a reference for this. Now, these people, the Americans, have called Kawea. Kawea, but their real name is the Mulawitam. And they have also come from Libya. Their language also evinces the Semitic language elements that we're talking about. And that they were associated with the ancient lake there in Libya. And they came here where they were located, what is now called the Salton Sea. The earlier form of that water body, very, very much larger than it is now, are modernly called Lake Kowea. <laughs> what the ancient people call, we don't know. But what is chief about it was that this is a fossil from there of this bivalve mollusk. This bivalve mollusk goes back to this as a symbol of the goddess Lamia there in Libya. And so these people, I'm saying, came to this place because, uh, at least at the time, this mollusk is only found there. It's only found here in this hemisphere at Lake Kawea. More recent times it has found its way into to certain places in the Caribbean, according to the research. But the idea is to see this uh, primitive looking being with the open mouth and many other things in the area shows that these people are related to the concepts that go along with all of this that I'm showing here. So we can see all of that. <clears throat> this here, you can look down here, this is uh, I'm pa I painted this, but it is a large, made of stone idol, is the way that I refer to it. Uh, there are two of these that are known. I've known one in person. Vivian's known of another one, like that. <coughs> and it's, it, however they made it, I don't know. It's, it's very heavy, very made out of stone. It's kind of flat. It's kind of flat. This comes from the Eastern Mediterranean. This comes from the same people of the Cyclades Islands that made the other uh, pieces that I've shown you of marble, uh, woman-shaped woman you know, marble pieces. This is an early, early one like that, and this was from uh, five, six thousand years ago. So that this was found in this vicinity of all these other ancient, ancient uh, European or Eastern Mediterranean evidence of, of these goddesses here. Then I want to come over here to uh, another people. Again, the Uto-Aztecan language is a linguistic category for uh, a group of people, First Nations people, that, you know, the Hopis are one, the, the the Kumeyaay, uh, people in northwest Mexico, and so forth, you know, all are, have the Semitic language elements. This is a language study that I'm referring to. And here, what I have here, this is to represent the people, the Yaquis. Now, the Yaquis, that's a Spanish name. That's not really, that's usually the case with most of these. The names of people are usually from another language, not their own. And so, this is a Yaqui mask, 
used in ceremonies called, you know, the Pascola, or Pacola, and it's a goat. It's a goat. These people were most interesting. Uh, Claudia and I, you know, our padrinos in that culture, we've spent, you know, decades and decades um, in that culture at a ceremony. So most, most interesting. These people, called Yaquis, are really from Egypt. That is, their ancestors are Egyptians. Their name for themselves is the Ohemi. Hemi is an Egyptian word for people. The prefix yo means venerable, the venerable people, the old people, that, and many other things, including their location in the Rio Yaqui, which has the only um, uh, bird, you know what I'm saying, a vulture bird, you know, Tokui, um, that is like the same vulture on the Nile, you know, um, and many other relations such a interesting, they are included in the language study used to Aztec and Semitic. But their language is Coptic. These are, uh, Copts are uh, a kind of a Latin Greek rendering that comes out of their word for Egypt. <laughs> They're e Egyptian Christians, basically, is who they are. So it's very, very interesting because um, the way we can say there's the Nile River, everything east of the Nile we'll say is Semitic. Everybody west of the Nile is Hametic. It's from the sons of Noah, Shem, and Ham. It's where the names came from. So everybody west of the Nile is going to be in that Hametic language. Now, the Yaquis are speaking this language that is actually Coptic. And this Coptic language goes back thousands of years. You know, figure, you know, 3000 BC. So they have a linguistic fossil here. And so it's very interesting because all that's tied up in this. And this particular feature of their culture, this features the goat Pan. You all know Pan. Well, his full name is in Greek, Ajipan. Ajipan means the goat Pan. And of course, the whole area of Greece, the Aegean Sea, I mean, everything is the goat, it's the world of the goat, <laughs> and so forth. Even the famous oracle of Delphi is figured had to have been discovered by the goats. The goats, you know, but the goat herd man, you know, came there and there was a cleft there, and the goats, when they looked into the cleft, they started getting excited and jumping around. And then the goat herd uh, man, he come over there and he looked in there and he got a whip and then he started prophesying. And so they give it, you know, that the goat was the source of Delphi that became the oracle, etc. It goes on like that. So the goats, goats, you know, everywhere. And also they go um, Capricorn, is much similar to Ajipan. Now very interesting, the father of Pan is here. This is Hermes. Hermes is the father of Go. He invented the lyre, which became the harp. So in the ceremony, there was a harpist who plays the harp, and a man wearing this mask is dancing to the song of the harp. The other thing is that this mask I have is the goat mask. The other masks are the old man, the bearded old man, exactly like that. And he's known to Hermes, in other words, Hermes is the kind of Greek name for even an older bearded man who is always figured as dark, as dusky. So the goat mask and the old man mask still survived strongly in that culture. And since it's also associated with fortune telling, and also I should say Hermes is also famous for, I don't know, uh, making a lot of little animals. So. The Pascola, when he starts, he is always honoring all of the little animals, frogs and lizards and, and things like that. So that's you know very, very conclusive in that. Now I want to come to another petroglyph I have here. You can see this one. This is Horus. Horus is, you know, that's the Greek name, you know, for Horus, uh, the falcon-headed or hawk-headed. Bean. These are all beans, 
that have taken on, you know, animal names or beetle names and things like that. And so this is a very, very interesting one. He's got a square, flat head and so forth. And this eye is most particular. Um, it is figured there in the, in the ancient world that the eye of Horus is food. Food comes from the light of his eye. And this eye has been made, you know, somehow with an hourglass figure in it to make it very particular and these stripes coming down which became very, I don't know, uh, kind of popularized among Native Americans of the Southwest. They called warrior marks. In other words, they put those, those two marks on their face. <clears throat> so this is also, and this is not the only one. <laughs> this is one that I've, I've picked out from the rock <clears throat> to show that this is, they had a porous featuring this eye, the eye that nourishes. Then if you go over here and you look at this figure here, well, I actually procured this from an Egyptian woman, like that. And this is, you know, like a tomb figure of Horus. You know, this is the hawk-headed guy, and he's got probably the sun there. And that looked all very much in the resonance of all this that I'm showing you here. So how do you like this, this trip there to realize that the ancient Mediterranean is a stem into Turtle Island, Native America. And while we're doing Black Lives Matter, all this is suggesting you know, that we change, that we uh, can outgrow you know, these, these fables that have um, you know, misunderstood people so that we can, you know, come into our, ourselves and our true alignments, alignments with our predecessors, so, so to speak. And that we can change you know, our, our whole country as Turtle Island is meant to be. To me, the great ancestress of Turtle Island, the name I think is best is Atanailihe. That's the Navajo name for the woman who changes and changes. She changes and changes anew, always finding herself anew. So I kind of like, like that. I mean, I definitely like that. I'm going to kind of end this with a poem written by Claudia. This is in her book, Keeper of the Fields, with her painting on the cover. And she's titled this one, The Corridor of Antiquity. You might recognize it where it is. High up on the Coso Range, wild horse mesa hides a sacred gateway to the remote and limited past. A naval military base forbids entry without security guards or clearance. En route, Joshua, Joshua trees beckon in a multitude of suggestive postures, and wild burros roam descendants from gold mine days. Once admitted into the Sky Roof Museum, my gaze glues to each quartz etching, high and low, neck arches and aches, footsteps fumbling. I've met paintings, poems, and stories that expand this human experience, but never like today. Thousands upon thousands lair after 16,000 year lair. Two miles of ancient glyphs, carved and scraped into basalt, staring faces, unearthly figures, leaping and dancing. Implore powers through the galleries of forgotten signs. Seek to make shamanic magic, big horn sheep medicine, bag for female rain. Exhausted, I sit under the weight of wonder. Spy a boulder that hisses, a snake head with pecked eyes and nose. Sure that I was seen what the artist saw, pressed to imagine what I could possibly leave that would endure these elements, a fire-breathing planet, the harsh gaze of time.